Hi there, my name is Jeremy Krug, and in this video we're going to be learning about standard units of measurement and the SI framework of measurement. If you're new to my channel, go ahead and take a look around. I'd love for you to subscribe and like my video if you uh, are learning something from this. Well, as we get into this concept of measurement, it's important to realize that in our modern system of measurements, we use standard units. Now, you might wonder, what does that mean? Well, when we say a standard unit, we're specifically talking about a never-changing unit of measurement that's agreed upon by everyone in the world. Now, if you think about that, that's very important. If you don't have standards where everyone agrees upon what a unit is, you can have confusion. Now, if you go back several hundred or even thousands of years ago, you'll find that most ancient systems of measurement did not use standards. What they used were units that were different depending on the person. So for example, you might have heard of the foot. People would actually measure things out based upon the length of their foot. Or maybe uh, there was something a little bit more standard. Maybe they'd use the king's foot. But if the king died, then you'd have a new foot when there was a new king. Perhaps you've heard of the cubit. A cubit is approximately the length between a person's elbow and the tip of their middle finger. The problem is, if you use a cubit, it might be different based upon the person who's doing the measuring. Perhaps you've heard of the hand. We sometimes use that even today to measure the height of horses. It's about four inches, but if you measure the height of something with a hand, it's different depending upon the person's hand that you're talking about. Now, scientists use the SI framework of measurement. Now, when we say SI, that stands for Système International, or in French, that means International System in English. Uh, SI was developed and adopted in the year 1960. And there is a misconception that SI is the same thing as the metric system. As it turns out, it's similar to the metric system, but it's not the same thing. Later on in this video, see if you can spot a major difference between SI and the metric system. Now, SI consists of about 29 units, but only seven of those are actually considered standard units. And we're going to learn about five of those standard units in this video here. So let's take a look at the first standard. The first standard is the unit of mass. And in SI, mass is measured with the kilogram. And when we say kilogram and that it's a standard, I actually mean there is a physical standard. There is a lump of metal that's sealed in a vault in France. And here's a picture of it here. And this is the kilogram for the whole world. The entire world has agreed that that block of metal right there made of platinum and iridium is a kilogram. And essentially, all the other uh, calibration weights and, and scales in the whole world are based upon that standard kilogram. Now, for those of you who are more familiar with the English system, a kilogram is about 2.2 pounds. And as it turns out, in our laboratory work, we find that a kilogram is actually quite a bit of mass. So it's usually more practical to measure mass in grams. And so very often in this class, and in pretty much any chemistry class, you're going to find that the teacher is talking about grams a whole lot more often than kilograms. Now, the second standard unit of measurement I'd like to share with you is the unit of length. And the unit of length is the meter. And you're probably familiar with a meter. This is a picture of a meter stick. Uh, for those of you more familiar with the English system, this is about three feet, three inches, and a third of an inch. So it's a little bit more than a yard if you're familiar with that. Now, a meter is defined as a fraction of the distance light travels in a second. And that's about one three hundred millionth the distance that light travels in a second. Light, of course, is very, very fast. A meter is just a very tiny fraction of that amount. Now, a third unit of measurement we're going to talk about that's a standard is the unit of time. And the unit of time is the second. Now, I imagine you're all familiar with how long a second is. Years ago, before SI came onto the scene, a second used to be defined as 1 86,400th of a day, basically the length of time it takes for the Earth to rotate on its axis. But there's a problem with using the second 
being defined as a fraction of a day. Because we find that the Earth's rotation is slowly but surely slowing down. And so, once again, a standard is something that has to be never changing. And if the length of a day is changing, then it's not a standard. So when SI came onto the scene, or a bit after that actually, a second became defined as the time it takes for a cesium-133 atom to vibrate between radiation states about 9.19 billion times. And so we have this vibration that's very, very fast, and there has to be an instrument to count that. Well, this, this is a picture of that instrument. It's called an atomic clock. If you have a cell phone, that cell phone is going to set its time based upon the cell phone towers, and the cell phone towers listen to a radio signal that's given off by the atomic clock, and it sets itself based upon that. So here we have a nice picture of the atomic clock, and the unit of time, of course, is the second. Another standard unit that you need to be familiar with is the unit of temperature. And the standard unit of temperature in SI is the Kelvin. Now, you might think that's a bit unusual because in the metric system, temperature is measured in degrees Celsius. In fact, this is one of the more uh, major differences between the metric system and SI. Metric uses degrees Celsius. SI uses Kelvins. And... As it turns out, in the laboratory, we use degrees Celsius quite a bit as well. And in a few countries, like the United States, there are a lot of people who still use the Fahrenheit scale. So often it's very useful to be able to convert among these three temperature scales. So if you're given degrees Celsius, if you take degrees Celsius and add 273 to that number, you're going to get Kelvins. And likewise, if you have to convert between degrees Celsius and Fahrenheit, you take degrees Celsius, multiply by 1.8, and then add 32, and you'll have degrees Fahrenheit. And so we often measure temperature with a thermometer that looks something like this. Now, as we talk about temperature, you're probably familiar with the fact that whenever you heat something up, the molecules start to move faster, don't they? And likewise, when you cool something down, the molecules move slower and slower and slower. Well, eventually, if you cool down uh, a sample of matter enough, the molecules will actually stop moving completely. And that temperature is called absolute zero. That's the coldest possible temperature you could ever have, because that's the temperature where all molecules stop moving completely. That's also sometimes called zero kelvins, or as you can see, that's approximately 273 degrees below zero on the Celsius scale. Now, sometimes you'll be asked to convert from one temperature unit to another. So for example, let's say we have this question where we're asked to convert 30 degrees Celsius to kelvins. Well, all you have to do is use this equation right here. Kelvins equals Celsius plus 273. And of course, we add 30 to the 273, and we find that the temperature is 303 Kelvin. So be able to do that uh, fairly quickly using a calculator. Now, what if we have a question like this? Convert 30 degrees Fahrenheit to degrees Celsius. Well, we're going to use the other equation here. Degrees Fahrenheit equals degrees Celsius times 1.8 plus 32. And we're going to plug and chug into this equation. We're going to take the 30 and plug it in for the Fahrenheit right there. And we're going to use simple algebra. So if we subtract 32 from both sides, we find that degrees Celsius times 1.8 equals negative 2. And so to solve for degrees Celsius, we just have to divide both sides by 1.8, and we find the answer is degrees Celsius equals negative 1.1. So once again, a fairly simple algebra problem that you can use to convert between Fahrenheit and Celsius degrees. Now let's talk about one other uh, standard unit in this video, and that's the unit of substance. And when we say substance, we're talking about counting atoms, talking about counting particles in chemistry. And that unit is called the mole. And we're going to use the mole quite a bit in this course. Not so much right now, but here in a few videos, we're going to talk about the mole. A mole is just a very, very large number of atoms or items 
or particles or ions or little teeny tiny particles basically and we use the mole for counting atoms and molecules basically one mole is equal to 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd teeny tiny little objects we'll talk about how big that number is in uh, a future video in this course that's about 600 to sextillion if you want to express that as a regular number so uh, there is the value of a mole now it's important to realize that even though we focus on the SI framework in this video and in this chapter the fact is in the chemistry lab we use lots of units that aren't SI units for example if we're measuring volume like volume of a liquid volume of a gas we often use liters and you're probably familiar with about how much a liter is maybe you've seen a soda bottle or a pop bottle like this and you know that that's a two liter bottle so one liter is about half of that also we talk about pressure quite a bit now the actual SI unit of pressure is the Pascal but to be honest a Pascal is a very small unit of pressure so we often use atmospheres and so one atmosphere of pressure is about the pressure that you're feeling right now if you're sitting somewhere close to sea level so most of you are probably feeling approximately one atmosphere pressure maybe a bit above that maybe a bit below that but that's normal atmospheric pressure at sea level one atmosphere now the next part of our discussion is about SI prefixes now we often use SI prefixes because sometimes it's just not practical to use the base unit by itself for example if I'm trying to measure the length of someone's eyelashes I probably would not use meter likewise if I'm trying to measure the distance from here to the airport I'm probably not going to use meters by itself I might use kilometers or for an eyelash maybe millimeters or centimeters so we have these very useful SI prefixes that help us to make our SI measurements more practical notice that every SI prefix here has a meaning a very specific meaning and it has an abbreviation whenever we take that abbreviation and put it in front of the abbreviation for a unit it actually means something so tera means a trillion of something maybe you've heard of a terabyte maybe a hard drive or something like that or a gigabyte that's a billion bytes or we talked about a kilometer or a kilometer that's a thousand meters or maybe you've heard of a milliliter that's one one thousandth of a liter and notice every one of these prefixes has an abbreviation now I have a few of these underlined and this is because those specific abbreviations are probably the most common that you would use outside of the chemistry classroom so be aware of those because these SI prefixes are very important these aren't all of the prefixes but these are the, are the most common that we use in the chemistry classroom now what do you think lowercase m capital L stands for well that stands for milliliter doesn't it milliliter that's one one thousandth of a liter like we said how about this one DAS well DA is the abbreviation for deca and S is the abbreviation for second so a decasecond just means 10 seconds now I know that we don't usually talk like that we don't say I'll be back in a decasecond but we could say that if we wanted to so these abbreviations are very useful how about capital M lowercase m well that means mega meter so a mega meter is just a million meters isn't it how long is a mega meter well that's a thousand kilometers or if you think of things in terms of miles that's about 610 miles or so how about this symbol right here this squiggly looking thing and then mol well that little symbol is the symbol for micro as you can see in the chart up here so this stands for micro mole or in other words one one millionth of a mole so be aware that these abbreviations for SI prefixes can be paired with abbreviations for units and they actually mean something 
Once again, I hope you enjoyed this video. I hope you learned something from it. If you did, please feel free to smash that like button and join me in the next video. We're going to continue our journey through chemistry and measurement.